when this cupola is not used for, for uh, maneuvering the arm, we can use it uh, taking pictures or looking down. And usually you don't have time during the day. You, mi you might be able to go there five minutes, but, but that's about it. So what I really used to do is in the evening, instead of uh, going to bed at 10, or I was supposed to, I would go to bed at 1 and take those three hours and spend an hour and a half there. In an hour and a half, I would actually go all around the world. I would take, you know, 40 minutes of pictures somewhere during the day and 40 minutes of pictures somewhere during the night, uh, starting from the oceans, the mountains, uh, the sea, um, the desert, uh, uh, frozen lands, anything. You know, it's interesting because in an hour and a half, you really can span the whole world, flying over, you know, Beijing, uh, Sydney, uh, Cork, uh, you know, London, Paris, uh, Rome, and, and so on. So pretty interesting. Uh, took a lot of, uh, of pictures up there. I took like 26,000 pictures in six months. I tweeted like three or four uh, per day. Um, here are some of them. You know, this is, uh, this is what? A desert? Ice. This is actually Patagonia in South America with a lot of glaciers there. You know, that float around there. Oh, glacier, 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 glacier. There's a high concentration of glaciers uh, down there. Um, this is a frozen uh, land up in uh, Canada. And uh, interesting, it looked like an aquarelle to me. It looked like a you know, piece of art. But it's, some of these things, you look at them, uh, you, can really, you can really come up with something that is, in my opinion, very interesting. Where, where are we? Do you know? What? Brazil. Brazil. Well, yes, well, it's a river. It's actually in South America. It's actually not really Brazil, but not far away. It's Argentina, a little bit south. This is up here, there are the Amazons, so there is a deep uh, forest. This is a big river. I mean, this is like 100 kilometers. Uh, so the, 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 probably if you would be sitting in this coast, you will not be able to see the end. The other side. It looks like a lake more than a river. It's not, you know, the, river, the little rivers we have here in Europe. This is a huge river. Um, you know, it, it's kind of brown, right? Why? What? Silt. Silt. Meaning, uh, yes, there is something into the water. But if you think about it, essentially, this looks like a static picture. In fact, it's a very, very dynamic picture. Inside there, there is a hill, if not a mountain, that is traveling now from one place to another place. That means that things are changing pretty dramatically. It's not a little thing, it's a hill dissolved into this river, and it has to go somewhere. And it's not just now, it's always. That means that the constantly the, the geography is changing, that means that the river has to change the course because it's trying to find the, the uh, shortest way to go to the, to the sea. And today is there, tomorrow is maybe here, or here, or there. Look how many, how many times has changed the course in, the, in its history. Uh, so that tells us that, that nature is seldom static the way we think. It's always changing. Of course, we, we look at it in five years time frame, five years it may not change. But look, in thousand years has changed 20 times. That means that if I want to plan something here and I want to build a city, probably it's not a good idea to put a city here. Because sooner or later we get badly flooded, right? Well, guess what? Most of the city are built exactly there. The Dublin is a small river here, but, but look at the other cities, I mean, you know, I was asked, I was in space, I was asked to take this picture and I took it. This, this in the middle is the Mississippi River, one of the biggest rivers in the United States. And in May last year, it uh, flooded. And so I took this picture, I changed a little bit the color. Everything in this picture that is not green is underwater. So, only the green parts are dried. Everything else is underwater with flood water from the river. This is a city, was a city. Thousands and thousands of square kilometers of cultivation gone. 
you know? And, and we are like, wow, why? How come? Well, guess what? It's normal. This is what the river do. I mean, they never stay there. Hmm? That was the Grand Canyon, by the way, Caribbeans. I'm, I'm showing this picture here because it's very nice. Yeah, there is a little bit too much light here, but very nice. But I looked, I was curious about these areas here. You know, what are these? There are some other here, here, there. So I, one day I went to the Russian side. They have a bigger window, a special window. You can take pictures there. You have really to be careful because you can be burned very easily. But I took this telephoto lens and took this um, relatively high-powered uh, pictures, but still like 20 kilometers here. And look at this kind of curtains of uh, sand, with the sand that is, uh, you know, put in a weird way and looks like it's changing every day. But there's this kind of currents, and this is how the island live. They are, they are alive. They move constantly. They are not the same. Uh, but then you look at something like this. Where are we here? Where? Dubai. Dubai, yes, this is Dubai. They had a city here, so they figured out, well, well let's build some islands, Palmyra, and some other. If you pay attention, this is the world. See, this is South America, North America, Africa, Madagascar. Guess what? They have an island there for Ireland. So if you want to go and live in Ireland, you can go there, by the way. Uh, but this is, if you think about, this is pretty interesting and nice, but at the same time, here now we are starting changing nature a little bit more than a little thing. Uh, this is Bahrain, by the way. They built another set of islands like that. I, here I don't quite understand because they have no city here. So on purpose, they decided to build this. Nevertheless, they had plenty of uh, space here. But if you look carefully, you see the coral reef here. And then suddenly, eh, no more coral reef in this area because they had to dredge all this area to find uh, the dirt to build this fish-shaped island. fish shape, so in the sea, it's very good. Uh, but now, now you think that the currents that were here and they were maybe feeding these uh, coral reefs here, maybe they're not there anymore. Maybe they changed, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what is going to happen here. I mean, I have no, no, no way to know. But sometimes we do things, and we do not take into account of uh, heavier implications and, you know, sooner a little bit here, a little bit there, we do change things and we do not even realize. You know, desert, 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 desert here. But this is picture is strange. You see the desert here, then there is a line in the middle and then a darker part here. Obviously, this is a city, you know, freeway, houses, kind of parks or green stuff, a really clear line between these two area. Kind of weird. You don't think it's weird, this picture? Where are we here? Egypt. It says Egypt. Cairo. Yeah, because most of you saw the pyramids up there, I guess. The people that did not see it, I'm just showing now. This is the pyramids here. So if you think a second, the, the Egyptian 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, were a little bit more attentive to nature. They knew that the river once in a while, would come and go. And they knew that this was the border where the river would come and go. So they had to build a, a temple for their gods. They didn't put it downtown like we did. They put it in a place where it doesn't flood. Because, you know, the mummies don't know how to swim. So they, they put it there. And as a matter of fact, three or 4,000 years later, we still have the pyramids, you know. If it would be us building a temple for our god or prime minister or queen or king or something, we put it here, of course, and then sooner or later, the Nile will come and take care of it, see? Where are we here? Ireland, all right. A little bit cloudy, hmm, okay. What about this one? Vesuvius, wow. It's um, Tenerife. Uh, it could be Tenerife, actually, but it's not. So it would be Tenerife, actually. Tenerife is almost just the, vol the volcano. I mean, this is a volcano. This is Vesuvio, actually. But I was amazed because what I saw from space is that, first of all, 
I always thought that, you know, 79 AD, there was this big explosion, covered up most of the area, Pompeii and everything. And I thought it was the little part of the mountain. Well, guess what? It was a bigger one. You know, it was a major portion of the mountains. It was not a little thing up here. But then I thought, wow, these houses are pretty close. I mean, if it's, um, Pompeii is somewhere here, here. So they're pretty close. So if you want to see where people are, and you have a, an estimate from space, you, you look at night and you get better, you see better. So three days later, I was flowing, fl uh, we were flying uh, above uh, uh, Vesuvio and I, I decided to take a picture at night. And um, guess what? This one in the middle is the hole of the Vesuvio. And this is a city where one million people live with the center of the city less than one diameter away from an active volcano. That's not really smart, I would say. So, um, Florida, United States, Tokyo in Japan, Japan, 37 million people in this area here. How many are the inhabitants of uh, Ireland? Four, four million, so you get 37 million living there. Uh, Beijing, seven million people, so. Uh, Malta. It's not Malta? It's not, it's not Valletta, no? Uh, what is this? What about this? You know everything. I wonder why. I wonder how you really know your geography here. Okay, very good. What about this one? What city is uh, this one? Ah, now I got you. New York, Rome, Italy. None of the four. New York, Rome, Italy. None of the three. It's actually Milan in Italy. This is Milan, Torino, Venice area, Rome. Naples again, Florence, you know, this is Italy. I usually show this picture to my fellow Italian citizen and telling them, you know, because as soon as I show this picture, you know, kind of tilted, you have to kind of readjust yourself. As soon as I show the picture, like, Italy, Italy, and I said, wait a second. This is mostly <clears throat> Central Europe, with Germany, the most industrial country in Europe, you know, Frankfurt area, Munich, then there is uh, Switzerland, the black hole here. Then there is uh, Austria, another black hole here. France, also kind of blackish down here. And then the Christmas tree of Italy here. And you know, and I, always, I usually tell my people they're very interesting because, you know, it looks like that in Italy we have a lot of petrol. We don't. Oh, then we have a lot of nuclear power. We don't. We don't have any nuclear power plant in Italy. Then where do we get all of this electricity or power that we need to maintain this grid? Well, we buy it from the Swiss, from the Austrians and the French, you know, and happily burn it up in the air because everything that I can see from space is wasted energy because you, you are illuminating space. You know what? You, you don't need, you need, you need lights down, not up in space. So everything that you see is wasted. So I used this one to tell Italy. In fact, just a month ago, they passed a law to start uh, breaking down some of these things. So interesting. Uh, all of these pictures are, uh, so I, I tweeted when I was in space. I sent down 632 pictures in this six months. And if you go to Flickr, which is a, um, it's an um, album, uh, online album. You can actually see all of these pictures with all the comments there, and it's pretty interesting. So if you have a little bit of time, I'm pretty sure there are uh, more detailed pictures of Ireland uh, sitting in there. So Let's see where we are here. It's, uh, I've talked for a, an hour and a few minutes here. I'd like to ask for your uh, patience for another 45. No, okay, let's make it a uh, few minutes. We'll close the talk. I'm going to go really fast here. Uh, go through some of the other activities we did in space. Yeah? The happy celebration of the, of the uh, Yuri Gagarin 50th uh, flight. Uh, there it is, Yuri Gagarin smiling. Um, uh, shuttle, we had two shuttles coming up and visiting us. Uh, 
Uh, some of them, uh, I mean, they were all interesting. One of them brought up an experiment called AMS, that is uh, trying to measure what is happening in the sky, in the universe. Very interesting. Should, uh, you should read a little bit if you have the time. Uh, we talked to our president of the Republic, of course, they were, because there were two Italian astronauts. One was on the shuttle, I was on station, so it, it was an exceptional moment. Uh, we fl we f fly, we flew a, an Italian flag up there. Um, we talked to the Pope for the first time. We had a private video conference with the Pope, uh, and so now it's official. The Pope talked to extraterrestrial <laughs> people. So. Um, and then it was time to come back, come back home. You know, 159 days later, five and a half, five and a half, five and a half months later, Dimitri is very happy. Um, uh, we actually detached from station, stopped a second, took some what somebody called prehistorical pictures because these are the only pictures that show the station with the shuttle attached. All the other pictures are never the, not, the shuttle was never there. So. Well, the, and in this 20 minutes, we stayed there 20 minutes, the station moved. So you have, uh, I took like 150 pictures in different uh, attitudes, so. Um, and then, then you continue with the re-entry. I told you the launch, shuttle and Soyuz are pretty much the same. Well, forget about it. The re-entry with the shuttle is, uh, it's kind of mellow, like an aircraft coming down and landing, a little bit rougher, but you know, not too much. Soyuz, nothing to do with it. It's a sequence of catastrophic event. No, the, <laughs> the, the landing, it's a sequence of catastrophic event that starts when you detach from the station and you think every five minutes, you think, okay, I'm dead. It was good, goodbye. And, uh, and it keeps going like this until you are laying down in this little thing, top of the parachute, waiting for what the, the Russian called <laughs> the soft landing which I can guarantee there is nothing soft about it. <laughs> you think you're dead five times. By the way, just a joke, I say that the shuttle lands uh, on a runway plus or minus 50 meters. You know, if you land into 50 meters, you are, you are good. If you miss, you're gonna die, so you better land into 50 meters. The Soyuz, uh, they call it a perfect bullseye center if you land plus or minus 10 kilometers from the <laughs> from the predicted landing, landed landing spot. So uh, if you land a plus or minus 10 kilometers from that place, then they are there waiting for you with helicopters, and obviously we were, we centered it. Uh, but there were a case, there, was a, there were a couple of three cases, they missed it by 400 kilometers. So they, they were there for five or six hours before they, they came and get them. So um, we landed also, there was not much wind when we landed, so we came down. <laughs> but there is, if there is wind and this happens, you're landing and then you start rolling, rolling and you go, you know, the, the parachute can, can carry you, then you have to, there's a command to detach the parachute, otherwise you start going and, and whatever. So, uh, it takes, um, takes about 45 minutes before they pull out all of the crew. Uh, you see that, you know, the spacecraft is charred because you are actually, you're actually entering and, and you are dissipating all this energy uh, by burning, uh, the atmosphere becomes like a blowtorch. So you are like inside a full blowtorch and your spacecraft is subjected to all of this deceleration and all things. It's really, really rough. Um, so they, they build up a little, uh, this is a Russian uh, thing, they build up this little thing, then they come on top and they start pulling you out. They usually pull out the commander first because he's sitting in the middle. This is Dimitri here, smiling. Um, <laughs> Not too bad. Then they pull out Kitty. Kitty was exceptionally well. I mean, she took the landing really, really good. You know, everybody feels in a different way. You know, she's, she's smiling, uh, sunglasses, talking on the phone, subtle phone to the husband, saluting like the Queen of England. If, uh, I would say she was coming from vacation here, if well known that she was, she was coming from space. And it, it was my turn, and I, I, I swear I was gonna die any second. I mean, I take really bad. The coming back to Earth, I really don't take it well at all. I mean, I'm nauseated, ready to throw, throw up any second. Uh, I'm, everything is weighs a ton. I mean, I don't feel really good. Look at my face, it's white like a, like a marble statue. Uh, I was telling them, slow down, slow down, slow down. I was trying to grab something in my pocket here. They didn't know what I was doing, and then finally I pull off. 
it was a barf bag. I mean, a, 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 um, a bag where I could vomit inside in, in case I was just about to vomit. So uh, then they pull me off, take me off, and they lay me on a stretcher, and that's as much as I did. I'm good, I'm okay, I'm alive. Leave me alone, please. Uh, they actually take you from there, they drag you to a medical tent, then they take off the suit, it takes about like half an hour, 40 minutes, then they put you in a helicopter, one of those helicopters, and then you fly, you know, on this thing for an hour and a half to the closest airport. There, there is a NASA plane, so they put you on the NASA plane, and then you fly back to Houston, 22 hours flight. You're back to Houston, you land in Houston, they put you in a van, they put you in Johnson Space Center, they put you in a car, and you may go home or go to another place, so by the time I got there, I said, give me a bicycle. So I've done the whole set of uh, uh, things from a spacecraft to an helicopter to an aircraft to a van, a car, and a bicycle, and I'm done, you know. Rollerblades, maybe, you know. But really, I couldn't walk. For a couple of days, I couldn't walk. So it's not a good thing. But uh, they have a pretty good uh, uh, recovery system, 21 days. Uh, you do four hours of physical fitness per day, four hours of medical experiment, which you are a test, the, the subject, and then four hours of debriefings, talking to engineers, to the flight controllers, to experimenters. And this lasts 21 days, and after 21 days, give you back your driver license, give you back, uh, and they tell you, you're free, you can go. So, uh, look at the future. I, I'm, I'm gonna only going to say that we started saying that one of the major reasons we go in space is because we want to explore knowledge, this kind of things. And, and in fact, when we look, at, when we look with, uh, with a little bit open mind, we find out that we really do not know much. I mean, we know more or less what's happening in our world. We have been to the moon, but that's about it. And you look what is around us, you f we, we find out that there is a lot of things that we don't know. You know, Mars, 100, million kilometers away. Today, if we would like to go to Mars and we would take one of our spacecraft, you know, it takes seven and a half, eight minutes to go to the space station, a week to come and go from the moon. It takes mm -hmm. two years from the Earth today if I want to go to Mars and come back. Minimum two years. If you are in, on Mars and you try to call mission control, you wait for 20 minutes 15 to 20 minutes that they reply to you. Just because the signal, the radio signal, takes that much to go back and forth. And Mars is really, really close to us for, for uh, um, astronomical uh, distances. It's nothing. Uh, 100 million kilometers is nothing. Which one is the star closest to us? This is a question. Outside of the solar system, which one is the star closest to us? Alpha Centauri? Proxima Centauri. Well, yeah, more or less, you know, these two big stars here are Alpha Centauri, which turns out to be two stars, by the way. So this is Alpha Centauri Alpha, Alpha Centauri Beta. But in fact, the closest one to us, by a little bit, more, it's Proxima Centauri, which is a little bitty, little bit, tiny star inside this red circle, if you can see it. That little star is the closest one to us. And it, what is the distance to us? 4.2 light years. That means if I would be able to go at the speed of light, which is what? 300,000 kilometers per hour. If I would be able to go at 300,000 kilometers per hour, oh, so, sorry, per second, you're right, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there was a slip. 300,000 kilometers per second, if I would be able to go 300,000 kilometers per second, it would take me 4.2 years to get there, which is still manageable, but we cannot go at the speed of light. Today's spacecraft go at about 30,000 kilometers per hour, 30,000 kilometers per hour, which is pretty fast. Uh, there's nothing on Earth that goes at 30,000 kilometers per hour. See, it says 25 here, Mach 25, that's the speed of the shuttle. 30,000 kilometers per hour is even faster. If I take one of our spacecraft and I go to Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri, at 30,000 kilometers per hour, it takes me more or less 162,000 years before I get there. 
And still, still, this guy here, for astronomical distances, is nothing. It's like me in the first row here. Think about, you know, 10 light years, 100 light years, 1,000 light years, 10,000 light years, 10,000 light years is still nothing. Which one is our galaxy, you know? Which one is our galaxy, where our solar system is? The Milky Way is our galaxy. We don't have a picture of the Milky Way because we are inside. But there are some other galaxies around. And we found this one, which we think is relatively similar, should be similar to the Milky Way. You know? So the distance between here and here is 100,000 light years. 100,000 light years, this is our galaxy. And we're still nothing. Still a little bitty tiny thing. 100,000 light years for space distances is nothing. You know, think about, you know, this galaxy here. See? Galaxy, 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 galaxy. You know, they, they before the Space Hubble Telescope, the astronomer had mapped all the sky, and there were some areas of the sky that were kind of dark. Couldn't see anything there. So they, when the Hubble Space Telescope was in space, they thought, let's point the Hubble at these areas that are dark and see if we can see anything. You know, they were, OK, let's try. So they, they, one day they took uh, the Hubble, they pointed to an area, a surface that is about the same as uh, one cent, a one meter distance. So, and they took a picture, like they look inside this thing in a dark area. This is the picture that came out. You know, this is the picture that came from that, that little thing. 150 galaxies in the little thing of the sky. So think how much stuff there is there. So we know really little. We don't know much. You know, how many planets there are in the universe? Don't know. How many stars? We cannot see the planets. So stars we can see, we can count. How many stars in the planet, in the universe? Billions. Trillions. Quadrillions. Gazillions. We don't know. A lot. And, and I, they always ask me, so you believe, do you think there are extraterrestrial people? There are extraterrestrial life? My answer is yes, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that somewhere there it's not possible, statistically speaking, that there is not a planet that has the same characteristic as Earth, even though we know that Earth has really, 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 really special characteristics. But I cannot believe that in all of this there is nothing like this. So I really believe that somewhere in the universe there is life, more than one Earth, more than one form of life. Uh, so I, I actually tell the kids to do an exercise next time you're at the beach. I like this, and I like you guys try to do it too. Uh, you're at the beach, take your hand, scoop up a, uh, some, some sand, then put it on a piece, a piece of paper, and then with patience, start counting the grains of, salt, uh, of sand in there. You know, toothpick, and you start counting. Don't sneeze. Um, so count, count, count. When you're finished with patience, throw away everything and think that probably the number of stars and therefore planets in the universe is equivalent to the grain of sands in the whole of the beaches of the whole world. So you really need to count a lot to get in there. So the bottom line I say is that we don't know much. We don't know much. There are still so many things we need to do. Of course, somebody's going to tell me, yes, all right, but how are we are going to fly there? You know, even Proxima Centauri, four light years, 162,000 years, we will never get there. And I say, well, never, never predict what will happen in the future because weird things happen and we never know. And I always say, you know, I always use this simple example. This is a regular cell phone, nothing magic. No, what we today all have, more or less. But if I would have given this to a Roman soldier, or to even my grandfather, you know, 50 years ago, I would have given this to grandma and father and said, here you go. You can call me when I'm in the United States, you can call me. He would have looked at me like, yeah, right. Uh, or, or, well, you can SMS me or check email. Or if you're lost, turn on the GPS and it will tell you where you are and it will tell you what, what, which way to go home. Right. Pretty much witchcraft, impossible. I probably would have said impossible. You're dreaming, you're reading something, you're smoking something. Yeah. So never know. I don't know what 
this guy is going to do, this guy is going to do in 20 years, you know, may discover, I don't know, something weird. The new technology. Maybe we'll build the, you know, the Star Trek beam me up Scotty thing. Yeah, maybe that will work, you know. Beam me up Scotty, I want to go to Proxima Centauri or to I don't know, Sirius, I don't know where, you know, something like this. So, I will close the talk finally with this, which is um, the future is actually ours. We are the one determining the future. It's not something else. It's not the government. It's not uh, the weather. It's us determining what we want to do in the future and how to do it and what to do. And I tell you that you really need to dream. You need to put yourself in a condition of coming up with something impossible. A dream, something not possible, something impossible. That's what a dream is. And then wake up and work on it because once in a while the dreams, even the impossible one, come true and we can do impossible things, especially you young guys. Okay?